Uh, that's a brilliant question. And your other question is brilliant as well, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. everybody welcome to the sin cast this is chris atkinson from cinema sins joined by barrett share from cinema sins hello and uh today we are going to speak to a very special guest uh director niasa hardman hardeman yeah. i hope i'm getting that right i have a, you know it, even if i've even though you told me what it is i'm still feeling like <laughs> i got it wrong your pronunciation uh, is perfect oh sweet <laughs> sweet uh she is the director of sea fever um yeah. And uh, what is uh, what is the uh, su- the release date for Sea Fever? By the way, the release date is August tenth. We had planned to splash it across American cinemas, but uh, instead we're going to splash it across everybody's video on demand. Ah, okay, and uh-huh. that's that's in August then. Oh, uh, sorry, April. Did I say August? I meant April. Yeah, April. April. Okay. 10th. Okay. Gotcha. Two weeks from now. Um, uh, of course, right off the bat. Um, we're so we're we're living in this age of the coronavirus, and um and and it's like you've made a a movie you made a movie before anybody you obviously made the movie before anybody knew anything about it, but <laughs> what was your inspiration for the story of Sea Fever? Uh, you're right. I mean, it, it does feel weirdly timely when you look at the film now. Unfortunately, I am sorry to say. Um, the the story is uh, it's a grounded psychological thriller with a sci-fi element and what I wanted to make was something that is a tense and propulsive thriller that also gives you something to kind of chew on and think about as you're watching this tense propulsive thriller so it kind of explores ethical questions about taking responsibility for ourselves and for each other and ultimately for our world so the the story is kind of root, thematically the story is rooted in this idea of the conflict between individual need and group need, and I think that's what makes it feel really timely because there is a there is an infection in the story, and the characters in the story do have to make a choice about well, do I protect myself but put the broader community at risk, or do I protect the broader community and risk myself and risk my own health? Or worse, risk my neighbor's health. I'm so sorry to to cut you off, but that's something that you never see in in a story like this. Like typically, you'll see uh, the outbreak and or the infection or something like that, and you'll see the response and you'll see you know uh, the the psychological aspect of it. But I, you typically don't see that moral quandary that we're all facing in reality right now of self versus community. And that was very, very interesting to see inserted into what you said. This is kind of a grounded psychological horror movie. Yeah, well, they're my favorite kind of films. I love that sweet spot in cinema between, you know, what cinema does best, spectacle and a kind of dream (laughs) reality. And also something that feels really rooted and truthful and authentic and that asks you questions that are kind of difficult to answer right that was a question i was going to have uh, i had about the uh the parasite that is in this or the the sort of the organism that has all the tendrils mm-hmm. that has the is that is that based in reality or is that a real thing well here's the thing it's it's the animal in the story is something that i invented but everything mm-hmm. that it is and everything that it does is rooted in truth. So everything that it does in the course of the story, there is an animal somewhere that does that thing. But huh. in the story, it is, you know, it's an amalgam of a whole load of different animals. So it's big because when you live in the deep ocean, you can have a really huge body because you're not subject to gravity, right? Uh, and um, I did uh, I did consult a marine biologist who said, yeah, an animal like that, I'd say that's a nidarian. So in the story, our character goes, I think that might be a Nadarian, which apparently is jellyfish. So it's a kind of jellyfish. Uh, So it has these long tendrils, which are not tentacles because they're not prehensile. They don't have suckers or anything. They're more like if you can imagine one big, intelligent organism that's kind of reaching out with its unified nervous system, with its tendrils to kind of feel its way into the world. It's that sort of 
long, elegant, beautiful thing. I wanted it to be really beautiful and mesmeric because, of course, what it is in the story is it's a metaphor for nature. It's a metaphor for the fact that nature is both gorgeous and huge and mesmeric and endlessly beautiful and also terrifying and unknowable and completely different from us, but we're a part of it. You're absolutely right about how beautiful it looks. The the underwater shots in particular in this movie were s- seriously mesmerizing. It, it, it looked great. Oh, I'm delighted you think so. That was really the intention was to create something that, you know, I feel like we have a lot of movies where uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a movie about an, the, an encounter with the unknown. And a lot of times you get a movie where it's an encounter with the unknown and it turns into, it's a monster. So you have chase, fight, chase, fight, confrontation, <laughs> defeat. And I go, well, that's dull, isn't it? I mean, a confrontation <laughs> with the unknown is actually pretty extraordinary. And so, you know, if it's something that occurs, you know, it's, it's set in the deep ocean. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep Atlantic. So there's every possibility that down in that biosphere, there are animals that we have never come across and that we might never come across, apart from the fact that we're pushing people like the people in this story into deeper and deeper water to fish in more exhausted and more exhausted fishing stocks. And and the truth is that those trawlers, those little mom and pop trawlers who go out from the west coast of Ireland are going into really deep waters. And quite frequently, they're drawing up from those deep waters animals that nobody has ever seen before and animals that Hmm. nobody really knows what they are. So it's not really that far into the realms of the unknown. But what I wanted with this animal was to say, you know, nature is beautiful and it's mesmerizing and it's fascinating for us. And then I wanted the animal to have that kind of bioluminescence that you get with those really deep sea creatures. So Mm -hmm. there's something kind of alive and moving all the time. And I wanted it to have this black, unknowable center so it doesn't have anything that looks like a face there's nothing you can anthropomorphize and go oh well it has a happy expression now nothing like that it's it, you can never really know it because it's something other right right that's what i uh, appreciated about this movie the most was the sort of the basis and reality there's no reason to make a big huge alien like monster down there because you can you have so many things to go off of that can be scary on their own uh, that actually (laughs) happen in nature. And, you know, this movie starts off like a lot of, of uh, typical underwater uh, uh, horror thrillers. And you're like, okay, well, I know what I'm in for now. And then you you realize that you're not, you don't know what you're in for at all. Uh, You know, anybody who's seen something like Leviathan or deep star six or the abyss or this year's underwater, is, you know, sort of, uh, oh, I know where this is going, and you don't, actually. That's what I loved about it. Oh, well, that's great, and I'm delighted that you felt that way. That's brilliant. I, I do think one of the roots of the story is is to try to get away from this idea that anything that's unknown or anything that threatens us is by its nature an enemy, you know, when actually that is that seems to me to be a fundamental kind of misrecognition of who we are. Uh, mm. misrecognizing ourselves as existing some, somehow outside of our ecosystem rather than being a dynamic and integrated part of it. So uh, where did you film this movie? We filmed it uh, in the deep water off the coast of Ireland, which was tricky and dangerous. Oh, and really? Oh. Recommend wow, so not a, it's no, not a water tank then. Uh, well, no, parts of it are filmed in a water tank in Sweden because it was just, it was A, so cold and B, so dangerous for the actor. Uh, and parts of it are also filmed uh, on a soundstage. So uh, there's a, uh, if you've seen the movie, there's a big long sequence at the end where, you know, there's, um, they're in quite a lot of jeopardy and uh, part of it is filmed out on the Atlantic and then you'll cut to a close up and that'll be filmed on a soundstage and then you cut to underwater and that's filmed in Sweden in a massive tank and then you cut back and we're in Galway and then you cut back and uh, so that whole sequence is shot in five different places and I can only applaud the actors for going okay no that's fine yeah it's all one scene and we're shooting it over seven weeks in three different countries that's no problem it'll be fine <laughs> you've got very talented people uh, working on this yes. uh, this step for sure yeah, um, we were very lucky that way your uh, your lead is Hermione Corfield who uh, actually doesn't have a long list of credits but she's been in some really big movies um 
And uh, the one that I remember her from is uh, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation um, because she plays the record shop girl in there. Uh, That's what, right. what, uh, what movie, what movies did you see that, that made you say that's, that's my, uh, I think it's, uh, is it Siobhan? Is that her name? Siobhan, Siobhan. I know we did it on purpose just to make everybody uh, struggle with Irish names. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Siobhan, do you know, um, I, I obviously I've seen all of her movies, but, um, but, I'm a great believer as a director in you get the person in the room and you work with them for a couple of hours and see how that works between you. Uh, and so I had a handful of actors that I was really interested in meeting and Hermione was one of them. And she was just so much fun and so clever and so subtle and so emotionally intelligent that it was just extraordinary and in that moment in the room I thought okay well we have our lead character she's this is the woman that we need to play the part so it wasn't even so much another uh, screen performance as meeting her and um, getting to know her and uh, improvising with her in the room and just seeing how incredibly creative she is Uh, and oh my god I mean the work that she did on that film is just extraordinary as you know the central character is she's quite withheld um, and there's a suggestion mm. in the movie that she might be neurodivergent and um, that she might think a little bit differently from the way other people think. Um, mm. And that's a really, really difficult thing to play because what you want to do as an actor is you want the audience to understand how you feel, but the character herself is not very good at getting people to understand how she feels and not very good <laughs> right. at, at understanding what other people feel. And I think what Hermione did was deliver this incredible tightrope performance where she's isolated and awkward and a bit kind of difficult and strange uh, and says the wrong thing and is quite rude by accident often in the film. (laughs) Um, While at the same time, letting the audience know how uncomfortable this is for her and how when she says the wrong thing and puts her foot in it, how awful that is for her and how much pain that causes her and how she wishes that she could say the right thing and how lonely she is. Um, and that's I think she did that unbelievably well. It's a very, very difficult thing to achieve, particularly because Hermione herself is gorgeous and incredibly charismatic <laughs> and really right. funny. So, you know, to have somebody who's uh, who's that kind of a charismatic person on set and then see her shift into this really subtle, committed, courageous performance was quite something. Also, can I say, she did all her own stunts. She did all those underwater stunts. Including oh, wow. Wow. Dive with no oxygen tanks. She's really something. I was wondering about that performance because it's such an honest uh, dialogue or d- delivery of dialogue. There's one moment in particular that stood out to me uh, just for how direct it was uh, when she has a moment where she propositions <laughs> one of the crew. Yes. <laughs> and just in it, it seemingly comes out of nowhere, but it's, it's a very direct thing. I'm kind of feeling this right now. You want to, <laughs> you want to make this happen. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's very, very cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. It was one of the things Hermione brought up with me going, okay, so she's pretty direct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and actually, you know, the, we were talking about it. Actually, we were talking about it as women because Hermione's gorgeous. Um, and uh, she said, you know, I would dream of, uh, of making that kind of move on somebody Um you know, I, I would do it through, you know, wearing a nice dress and, and putting on makeup. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I would be indicating to the person that I was interested. She was so strange that she just like she's sitting there in her jumper <laughs> going, yeah, I'm hungry. Right. Uh, but in a way, the two of us were kind of laughing, going, there's something so freeing about that. <laughs> <laughs> you always see it as the other way around, well, and, uh, yeah. especially and in think- cinema. Exactly. Yeah. And she is somebody who speaks her mind, whether for good or ill, you know, the character is somebody who doesn't really, she's not very good at veiling her, her feelings or her thoughts. She just kind of says it out straight. Um, but the one thing about that character, which is also very true of Hermione, is she says everything, uh, not that Hermione says everything out straight, but the character says everything about out straight. But she's also incredibly ethical and loyal. Mm-hmm. And if you were hanging off the edge of a cliff, by God, you would want this character on the other end holding onto the rope because she would never let go of you. And that's kind of what the story is, that, 
you know, you might people you might meet people who think differently to you who are neurodivergent who say the wrong thing and don't get your jokes and you know, you might think, oh, that person is cold or they're not connected or they don't want to be friends when actually the opposite is true. Uh, and those people often feel very deeply as this character does for their fellow humans and are willing to mm. sacrifice everything for people. I, this uh, this character is probably my my new model for heroism because <laughs> I, I, and, and it's and it's weird because it's not a character that a lot of movies are going to be able to copy because the situation in this movie is so unique. And, mm -hmm. and so like, it's, it's, it's hard to get a character that has, has, has to run down all the different things that she does in this. Uh, but there are so many things in here where she's actually the ship's antagonist. Yeah. Uh, and I, <laughs> and, and it's, it's one of those things where like, you, you, I, you, it, it makes you ask a lot of questions as to whether or not uh, the, morally and ethically is this is this right? Uh, is this is this against free will of the people that are you're you're living with? And you know, it's one of those things that I, I was sitting there going, "Man, I I, I love everything she's doing in this." <laughs> uh, but she's also, uh, she's also like, you know, she's an antagonist to the crew. And what would you do if you were, if you're, you know, you had to make a bunch of money and, and she was saying, no, you can't make money now. I'm, I'm really delighted to hear you say that. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not really that interested in the idea of villains who are terribly villainous. I think it's much more interesting if you get a group of people together, all of whom are struggling and doing their best and making choices that they think are the best choices in the circumstances. And then sometimes those choices turn out to be really disastrous, but it's not out of any kind of malign intention. So everybody in the story is doing their best. And she, as you say, is absolutely the antagonist for the rest of the crew, where the rest of the crew are really kind of integrated and they're one big family, certainly for the first half of the story, mm. not really a part of that family and doesn't really want to be. Um, and then as, as you know, the problem of the film uh, establishes itself, she transforms in that, A, she's, she starts to feel more connected to the other people on the boat, and also that she starts to take responsibility for them and starts acting in a kind of leadership role because she feels that duty of care and responsibility that we kind of all have for each other. But it's not mm. that other people on the boat don't have that. Like, I think the, the captain and the first mate do have that. They just think that different actions are a better idea. Um, mm. And, you know, I, I do like that, that everybody's right, even though they're heading for disaster. Uh, and there's something kind of interesting about that, that I hope when you're watching it, you're going, I'm actually not quite sure who I agree with here. Because mm -hmm. I can see the value of what they're saying. Just get right, just right. Get home. And you're you're the owners slash captains of the boat, uh, Doug Ray Scott and Connie Nielsen, uh, some familiar faces uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Doug Ray Scott, I know from Ever After. I remember when Ever After came out, and, uh, oh, and yeah. I remember um, uh, Mission Impossible too. Because hey, you probably saw a lot of Mission Impossible movies. When you <laughs> I only uh, cast for Mission Impossible movies. That's my rule. That's correct. Well, also, and Connie Nielsen happens to be in one of our favorite movies of all time, The Devil's Advocate. Oh, that's uh, right. Which yeah. I would say that she's most known for that, right? Uh, Gladiator, anybody? <laughs> Gladiator, yeah. And and she plays uh, she plays uh, um, the uh, Max's friend's mom in Rushmore. Oh yeah, no. I mean, she's got tons of credits. I just yeah. uh, we we just have an uh, an uncanny love of that movie, the uh, the Devil's Advocate. Oh, yeah, for that. no reason oh, whatsoever. That. Yes, yeah. one of the best portrayals of the devil on screen. I think we might argue. Yeah, yeah. There you go. And one uh, of the most over the top monologues at the end of all time. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're not talking about the Devil's Advocate. We're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is it? What was it like to working with those guys? Those are uh, uh, obviously like they have they're veterans now. They're like twenty something years of uh, industry experience, which is hard to believe when I when, mm. I, when I say it out loud. <laughs> well, here's the thing: um, the woman who owns the real trawler that we used in the story is this absolutely brilliant woman, and um, she's a native Gaelic speaker who lives in really really far distant island off the west coast of Ireland. Um, and she introduced me to her husband, uh, and I, I actually can't remember his name, but but he's an Icelandic guy. And I went, oh, that's mm. amazing, you're married to an Icelandic guy, that's so unusual. And they both kind of looked at me blankly going, 
no. <laughs> and they explained to me that because they're fishing people, and of course I was too stupid to realize this, they're fishing people. So they're fishing uh. all north and south of Europe on that western seaboard of Europe. So they know every other fishing boat that's filming, and that's filming, that's fishing out of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland. They all hang out together. They all go to the same bars. They all know each other. They all marry <laughs> each other. And there was something so lovely about that, about this kind of transnational community. And the fact that the that those small boats are really genuinely made up of people from all over the world. And they come together and they make these communities and they're really, really tightly connected and they come from lots of different places. So it was something I really wanted to do um, in the film was to say, OK, so the people own this boat. One of them is Irish and the other one is Scandinavian because that's really common. So I contacted Connie Nielsen and I showed her the script and she is fantastic. And she said to me, you know, I come from a tiny fishing village in Denmark. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she <laughs> knew the everything there was to know about the <laughs> lives of these people and how vulnerable they are and how economically uh, fraught their life is. Uh, and she was really keen to do the story for that reason. And that was just so brilliant because, of course, Connie is so charismatic and she mm-hmm. gives such an intensity of performance and she's so generous and she's so committed and she's just brilliant to work with. She's so generous to the other actors and she's such a joy. And she has this kind of leadership quality. She walks into the room and your eye goes to her. And she's mm-hmm. really direct, but she's really warm. She's really kind. Um, but she doesn't take fools. You know, she is a natural leader. Um, similarly, I mean, we were so lucky that that uh, D. Gray Scott responded to the material. I remember having a phone call with him when he just read it, going, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, which was just amazing. It's what you <laughs> long to hear as a director. Yeah. Um, uh, because, again, you know, he's a man who has this kind of alpha dog energy, doesn't he? He's like, mm-hmm. he's he's just beautiful and full of machismo, but he's also full of tenderness and sensitivity. And he was just such a delight on set. So generous with the younger actress, so kind. And the two of them built this ensemble together and took their leadership roles in the story really seriously. They learned how to pilot that boat. They could take it in and out of the harbour. They learned how oh, to yeah. fish. They were absolutely brilliant. And Dugray said to me, you know, uh, he, the first time he read the script, he went, the thing I love about this story is the transformation of his character. Saying that, it, mm. that again, it's this thing, There's no nobody is a villain. Everybody does their best. And sometimes your best turns out not to be such a great idea, but that doesn't mean it was the, wasn't the best idea you had at the time. Um, mm. And as you know from the movie, you know, those two people are really carrying a huge weight on their shoulders both in terms of the responsibility of the re- for the rest of the crew and also this grief that they carry with them into the story that inflects all of the decisions that they make. Oh my god, there's one single sound that Connie Nielsen's character makes after a specific incident happens on the boat that uh, affected me emotionally, but she played it beautifully where... Uh, uh, something malfunctions and she has a very emotional reaction, even though she's in this leadership. Um, yeah. uh, and it's the first uh, time you really see her. Role. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Two takes. We did two takes. It was the first day she was filming. Uh, oh, wow. I, I said to her, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. This is the first thing we're shooting. She went, it's fine. I know what I'm doing. It's absolutely fine. I went, do you want to rehearse? Do you want no less shoot? Okay. We'll shoot. Action. She delivers this absolutely stellar performance. We all look at each other going, well, we have it. And it brings me, yeah, the uh, superstitious person that I am. I'm like, let's just do one, let's just do one more just in case. <laughs> so I go, do you think you could do another one? She goes, yeah, no problem. I go, okay, action. Another absolutely heartbreaking, stellar performance. I go, cut. Okay, uh, let's move on. Right, that's that. Oh, my God. <laughs> just <Yeah>. astounding. <laughs> From a standing start, she delivered that performance. It was it was really something to see. What a crazy exp- this this whole experience sounds just pretty amazing. Uh, this is this your first feature film? This is my first feature film. Will it ever be this good again? We ask ourselves <laughs> <laughs> many many times. I'm sure. I certainly hope so.
Um, that's something else about this movie. Uh, it this is usually you know sort of a testosterone fueled kind of thing, but you have three women on board on this uh, in this on the ship, and I, and I guess the other these other thrillers they try to throw in like one or two women every once in a while, but these people look like they are just very like this is their life. This is something that they. Uh, have always done and everything. And you have, uh, you know, surrounding the, you have the, you have some people in the supporting cast who are ex- extremely good too. I, wh- what would you like to say about the other people we haven't mentioned here? Because they're, they're also very good, but I, I don't think many of us are very familiar with them. Mm. Well, first of all, on the point of, uh, of um, gender parity, uh, when I was developing the script, one of the producers said to me, you know, you want the, the central figure, I understand you want the central figure to be isolated, so maybe make her the only woman on the boat. And that isolates mm. her a bit more. And hmm. I thought that is absolutely the opposite of what I want to do in this story. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we all live in the world. The world is full of different kinds of people. It's pretty much evenly split between boys and girls when you're walking down the street. <laughs> so why would you set up a world where that isn't true? Um, and I, I really, really did not want that to be an issue in the story um, because it isn't really an issue. It, I'm sure it's not an issue in your life. It's not really an issue in my life. I don't walk onto set going, here I am walking onto set as a woman. You know, mm. mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's just not something that you think about very much. It's um, you think about, you know, what you want to do and where you're going and what's interesting to you and what's exciting and what's, you know, what you can smell and see and what you want to deliver and create. So I wanted that to be what this story was about. I didn't want to be hammering home some kind of 1950s surprise, surprise, there's a woman in the room. Like, that's just <laughs> not interesting to anybody, I don't think. Um, so it was really important to me that it would be, you know, uh, that the boat, there's a brilliant quote from um, an autistic writer called Zosha Sachs saying, to write the ship of humanity, we require all hands on deck. Mm. And it was mm. something I kept thinking about while I was writing and while we were shooting to write the ship of humanity, we require all hands on deck. And uh, Zosia Sachs is talking about neurodivergent people. And I have come across the quote because the central figure, uh, Siobhan, is neurodivergent. But it is also true that on the boats, um, you know, you've got men and women working together. You've got uh, Middle Eastern and North African and South African and European all working together. Nobody thinks about that stuff. All they care about is, are you good at your job and are you fun to be with? Can I stand being in a room with you for three weeks solid on a boat? That's all they think about. And there's something so wonderful about that. You know, in a world where we're all becoming increasingly obsessed with nationalism and my country, not your country, it was just so nice to go, look, here's this really, really traditional, um, incredibly uh, old way of life that is also completely integrated and completely transnational. And that was something that Mm. was really important for me to reflect in the movie. You definitely did that because all, well, all three of the female characters are super strong. Like you wouldn't mess with them. Um, <laughs> well, they're people, right? They're just yeah. three dimensional people, like the people that you meet in the street. And, and the people that end up on the boats tend to be, you know, pretty interesting, sturdy, strong willed people because the work is hard. So you don't do that work unless you're really able for it. But in terms of the other actors that uh, that you were saying we haven't mentioned yet, we had the absolutely brilliant good luck of having uh, Ardalan Esmaili play. He's so great. I think he's wonderful. And he is somebody that uh, whose screen performance I had seen before I met him. He, he was the star of a film called The Charmer by Milad Alami. It's a Danish film. Mm. And then um, I saw the movie and I thought this is the guy that I want for Sea Fever he has everything that we need he has this focus and intelligence and sparkle and natural Mm. charm and he's funny and he's self-deprecating he is just a delight Mm. and then of course we were super lucky to have uh, Alwyn Fuere who is a, a national treasure here in Ireland of both stage and screen. I was about and- to ask, it, it, usually when you, I see an actor that I've never, ever seen before, but they're in a movie that, uh, you know, is is uh, is from another nation. I'm like, I bet that person 
is an absolute star <laughs> over there. You are so right. You are and so we've, right. I mean, and we've been deprived. <laughs> we've been deprived of that person. So, you know, I, I was sitting there going, man, she's amazing. She's amazing. And I was like, why have I not seen her before? And I, I was like, I bet in Ireland she's like a top top notch you are not wrong you are not wrong she's uh she's sort of an irish version of tilda swinton if you can imagine that somebody who's really um able to transform herself physically and emotionally she does a lot of work with artists the first time i saw her she was doing this extraordinary performance of salome uh the oscar wilde play she's just an amazing amazing performer uh, really intellectual, really physical, does a lot of experimental theater, does a lot of film, does a lot of visual art, totally courageous, totally fearless. Oh, wow. She's in um, she's in that Nicolas Cage movie, Mandy, yes, that came she out. Is. She's in Mandy. Yeah, she yeah is. you should check her right. out in Mandy. She's I remember. Good. What's interesting to me is that you seem like such a a film lover. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, I was, I was doing a little background uh, stalking of you beforehand. I say it in a nice way. Uh, uh, Googling. Um, and uh, notice that you, you got a PhD in film studies. That's right. Yes, I have a PhD in film theory. So I can, uh, I am a doctor of film theory. I can prescribe you any kind of cinema. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so you transitioned from being a film lover, so much so that uh, you were in academia, to, to making it uh, yourself. What was that transition like? How did you decide? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing this myself. Well, to be honest, it, it, it all sort of happened all at once. So I started out. I went to art school, and then I did a postgrad in Berlin, where I got interested in film and video. And then I started working and um, doing animations. And I got in in the early um, world of CG and stop motion and motion control rigs. And that's kind of how I got into directing through this very visual sphere. Um, huh. And uh, I, I've done all kinds of things. I made documentaries and, uh, and I made uh, a lot of TV drama. Uh, and while I was kind of doing all that stuff, there's something about when you're making work, you get so involved in the how, you know, in the aesthetics, in, in the, um, the narrative in what you want to say and how you want to say it. And there's something really lovely about at the same time as you're doing that, taking time out to think about the why. Um, so mm. while I was doing all that stuff, I did, I did a master's um, in, uh, in film and video installation sculpture. Then I did another master's, which was um, in uh, aesthetics and politics, looking at kind of aesthetics and, 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 how politics gets inflected or how politics kind of enters aesthetics. And then out of that, I did one in, in film theory. So I was kind of doing, I did a PhD in film theory. So I was kind of doing all that at the same time as, uh, wow. as I was developing my practice. And I, what I really find is they feed each other. So I recommend it. It's, it's actually kind of great um, because your practice and the work that you're doing gets nourished by these kinds of ideas that are floating in from a really different way of thinking about cinema. And it's just all really hmm. enriching and fun. That's fascinating. So, uh, so what would, uh, you're going to give you a question that we often get. What are your favorite movies? Oh God, that's a horrible <laughs> question. <laughs> I know, right? It's terrible. Um, I guess it, it totally changes from day to day. Um, but I'll tell you one thing. I remember seeing Atom Agoyan, the, uh, the Canadian filmmaker, speak at BAFTA mm -hmm. in London, and he said this really brilliant thing. He said, essentially, there are two kinds of filmmakers. Those who think there are two kinds of filmmakers and this no, there are two kinds of filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> there are filmmakers in the tradition of Jean Renoir. In other words, people who want to try to capture the world in a really unmediated way and make you think that you're looking at reality. So I don't know, I guess people like Noah Baumbach, um, where mm. there's almost a documentary style to the way that he's shooting that makes mm -hmm. you feel like this is all just completely authentic and I am watching somebody's life unfold in front of me. Um, and we all know there's a massive amount of art involved in that, but the intention is that you feel like it's this unmediated reality. Uh, and he said, then the other kind of film major, maker is rooted in uh, the world that was established by Fritz Lang. In other words, mm. that they take reality and they build a kind of parallel version of reality and they articulate emotional truths 
through this parallel reality or this dream world. Um, and I was sitting there going, oh, God, if that's true, I definitely think I live in Fritz Lang's world. So I do, <laughs> I do love that kind of cinema. I do love that cinema where uh, the, the director kind of brings you into a dream reality which feels heightened and uses all of the artillery of cinema you know, beautiful spectacle and amazing sound design and music and performance and all of the things that um, that just make us feel really ecstatic at the movies. At the same time as using that to create a story that really asks you questions and demands of you to think a little bit more and not to be lazy about the way that you're engaging with the characters. So I think the mm. filmmakers who, who do that, who manage to do that, uh, are the filmmakers that I really love. So the people that I go back to over and over again are people like Alan Pakula, because I mm -hmm. just think mm. he's the most extraordinary aesthete who also gets these absolutely beautiful performances out of his actors. Um, Fassbender, I think, does that as well. The, the mm. performances are just amazing, and there's always this incredible attention to the medium itself and what he's doing with the camera, what he's doing with the pictures in order to tell you his story. Um, I also love people like Ridley Scott, who's an ex, an ex visual artist like me, um, <laughs> who, you know, tells these fantastic, um, big, beautiful stories uh, that can also be, you know, interesting and challenging at the same time as drawing everybody in. Ang Lee does the same thing. Um, yeah, I think that that's the kind of filmmaking that I really love. Yeah. When you're a that that particular style that you were talking about, that Fritz Lang style, would you put somebody like Alex Garland or even Denis Villeneuve uh, in in that sort of? I, should I, I wouldn't totally say category. Admit, and I love Alex Garland, and I really love Denis Villeneuve. I I think uh, mm. both both of those guys huge huge references for me. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, the the way that you were describing uh, this sort of this sort of mentality or this sort of school was very. Uh, I was thinking a lot about Annihilation and a lot about uh, Ex Machina and uh, you know, Arrival, uh, things that uh, Villeneuve has done. Um, uh, Villeneuve, uh, to me, is is such a thought provoking uh, auteur that that's trying to do. I think exactly what you were saying. And uh, wow, I love your answer so much. <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And I'm so delighted that you raised those two films in particular were really at the front of my mind uh, when I was writing this and when we were making it. Like that was absolutely the tone um, that I wanted to try to reach for is this beautiful intersection between something that doesn't, doesn't um, expect you as a viewer to be stupid, that acknowledges that you want, you want to be asked questions. You want to reach right. for something at the same time as delivering you a really exciting aesthetic experience. And Denis Villeneuve in particular is so brilliant at that. But yeah, the, uh, that I, is a really important reference. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, just thinking about uh, the the imagery in uh, Enemy um, and how that sudden appearance of something so unusual uh, reminds me a lot of Sea Fever, and uh, I can see a lot of parallels there. Oh, great. <laughs> I want to watch um, a bunch of movies with you is what I'm saying. Like we should sit down. That. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. We would learn some things that we oh, well, know. <laughs> you could prescribe us some movies. Okay, yeah. Yes, yes. Doctor film. Yeah, I'll totally do that. <laughs> um, since I've asked you the terrible question of what your favorite movie is, let's get deep. Uh, the I want to know the significance of the Neve Kinnor uh, mm. since – that's a big story that Connie Nielsen tells uh, in the in the uh, in the movie. I've looked it up, and I, I've seen the basic outline of what that story represents. But what does it represent to this movie? Uh, that's a brilliant question, and your other question is brilliant as well. Just so you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, that's a brilliant question because it really um, where I was coming from with this film was um, I had this kind of unease about how science is getting reflected through popular culture. And I didn't understand why there was this antagonism towards reason and the scientific method. And you see it a lot in popular cinema, and it goes all the way back in our culture to Frankenstein. This idea mm. that scientists are untrustworthy, that they have a God complex, that they somehow operate contrary to the public good. And that seems to me to be 
troubling and demonstrably untrue. So I wanted to tell a story that would really valorize the scientific method and that would valorize somebody who puts reason ahead of panic and emotional wishful thinking um, and for whom the scientific method is always the gold standard that they use. And that's what that central figure is. Um, and I wanted to, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, okay, so what's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of the scientific method? And the opposite of the scientific method in my mind is magical thinking. This idea of where, you know, what you wish were true, you just decide is true. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I wish climate change weren't happening, so it probably isn't. But right. That's mm -hmm. sort of thinking, you know, um, and we're all, we all do it. Um, and the more I kind of, because I'm really nerdy, I, the more I researched <laughs> into this, the more I discovered that actually my understanding of magical thinking was really quite shallow and that there's a lot to it that's really interesting. Um, Magical thinking is one of the things that's, that keeps us kind of uh, in, uh, keeps us healthy and stops us from getting sad because you need to have a slightly artificially positive view about what the future holds in order <laughs> to kind of go forward with joy and pleasure in your life. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And of course, the way that we all talk to each other and think about the world is through stories, which is a form, you know, parables, which are a form of magical thinking. And so what I wanted to do in the film was position Siobhan at one end where, you know, she really, really cleaves to the scientific method to her great benefit, but also to demonstrate somebody like Freya for whom magical thinking um, and, and this use of, uh, of mythology and the notion that, um, her, that she's, she's lost a child, that her lost child is with her, um, mm. that there's nothing wrong with that and that actually that gives her great solace. And it gives her courage and it gives her strength. And that's good. That's good. And um, the other thing I wanted to do with the uh, with the idea of Neve Kinor is because Neve Kinor is, is all tied up for both for Connie Nielsen's character and for Dugray's character. It's really tied up with loss, but it's also tied up with hope and, um, you know, the magic of the ocean. And you never know what's going to happen next. And the excitement and thrill of, you know, the extraordinary beauty that the ocean can throw up that does feel magical um, but Neve Kinor herself is a kind of a hero and so at the end of the story what I wanted to do was tie that back in and say you know somebody like Siobhan who's incredibly ethical and who cleaves to the scientific method when it would be easier just to panic and lose her head and who thinks <laughs> rationally about what would be best for everybody around her that at the end of the story through her strength of character, actually, she does become a kind of magical hero. Yeah, I, I was, I was thinking, uh, maybe not that deeply into it. But <laughs> I, I'm so glad that you gave me that explanation because I, because I was, I was sitting there thinking very basically. I guess in a way, I'm, uh, you know, this is right. But I was thinking that the their belief in this myth and everything is something that. Uh, you know, they name the boat that they name their child that uh, they have a superstition about red hair on the mm. on the boat. Yeah, uh, you there know where are all that these. Comes from? I'm sorry. You know where that comes from? The I don't. The superstition about red hair on boats. It's I I don't know how true this is, but I, I've been told it by a few different people that uh, there's this superstition in the west of Ireland that you shouldn't have a red head on a boat. Um, and I was told by a few different people that um, it's to do with the Viking invasions during the, the Middle Ages, because it, people think that Irish people are redheaded, but actually redheads are incredibly rare in Ireland. Uh, most Irish huh. people have really, really pale skins. We never get a tan. Um, the kind of traditional <laughs> Irish good looks are, are very pale blue eyes and dark hair. Like that's sort of the, the traditional community that, that was rooted in Ireland in the medieval period. And so the theory goes that... Um, the blondes and the redheads were these pillaging, robbing Scandinavians who were coming down in their longboats <laughs> and taking all the gold out of the monasteries and burning all the villages. And so if you see a redhead on a boat, that's a really bad sign. Oh, wow. <laughs> I believe that's got to be where it comes from. It sounds, sounds so right. How could it be wrong? Wow. <laughs> Can I ask you just a general question here? Uh, we... Uh, We've been running down a list of, of our favorite um, 
typically American movies of the last uh, decade or so. And uh, we, we've also talked in the past about being more exposed to international cinema. And I've been really impressed with a lot of the stuff that I've seen from Ireland. Sing Street in particular comes to mind, uh, it, it, immediately to mind. Is there any, um, are, are there any recommendations that you have off the top of your head for Irish cinema that uh, that would be kind of a good entry point there. Yeah, I mean, we've had a we've had something of a renaissance here. There's um, there's been quite a few filmmakers that have emerged in the last few years who are terrific. John Carney, of course, who made Sing Street, is one of them. Uh, Lenny Abrahamson, who made Room. Uh, yeah. Made, oh, his, yeah. His uh, his first two films are set in Ireland, and they're both absolutely brilliant. Uh, one of them is called Adam and Paul, which is really funny, uh, very hmm. sad story set in Dublin. Uh, and the other is called Garage, which is set in rural Ireland. Uh, so they're definitely worth looking at. Um, there is a new film out called Herself, which is getting rave reviews, written by an up-and-coming Irish screenwriter called uh, Keelan Dunn, which is set in Dublin. It's a okay. terrific film. Um, there are loads of good filmmakers. <laughs> yeah, I should say so. I mean, and we ha- this you are our second uh interview in a row from that uh oh, from really? Ireland. who's the yeah. other one doing? Uh, tell me um, oh, it was lorkin finnegan oh, yeah, lorkin. Lorkin. From... i know lorkin well of course do you really of course it's ireland <laughs> John Barney lives like five minutes walk from where I live. I know Lorcan very well. <laughs> well, he was he was fantastic, and we saw his uh, feature Vivarium, uh, which was really really terrific too. Oh, I'm delighted you like um, it. It's really good, right? You guys are establishing quite the community there. <laughs> oh yes, and we have a very dystopian view of life. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's, it comes in handy these days. <laughs> I know, totally. Yeah, yeah well, his film is particularly resonant right now this idea of being trapped at home oh my god yeah that both of these movies actually could not be more timely really yeah it's true unfortunately i wish it weren't so but <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it, i will say this that once it gets to that point where they're they're having to figure out whether or not to go back or to keep at going out there and fishing that was where i just was like uh, did she have some sort of knowledge that <laughs> we didn't because it really feels like it feels like you're practicing the dark arts uh, once it gets to that point. Uh, uh, yeah. I was just like, holy crap, this is exactly how it's going right now. I know. Right. And they have this conver- this conversation about whether they should quarantine. It's really precise. It's really specific. And they have this yeah. massive argument going, no, we yeah. need to go to the hospital. Nobody can help us. We have to quarantine. It's actually kind of scary watching it. Well, <laughs> even even to the point of, of where uh, Siobhan figures out the amount of time that it took for one of the crew to get infected or show signs of infection. Yeah. And how that plays into a lot of uh, the decisions because they are only thirty hours away or something like that. Yes, that's right. They're not far. Yeah. And 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 you know and so they're like, well, none of us are infected, and she's like, well, he didn't show symptoms for thirty six hours, so you know he, yeah. we're still we're still not and we're still not clear here. That's but exactly yet they still it. have. Oh my gosh, I was just like that part of this movie. I was I was just like so riveted uh, because it was so crazy accurate. Yeah, I know. It's uh, I I I saw it. Obviously, I was in Toronto. It screened in the opening night of the Toronto Film Festival, which was super exciting for all of us. Wow, uh, and kind of nerve wracking also. I got to say, uh, but I <laughs> congratulations because I went off to film something else straight away, so I hadn't seen it until it screened here in Dublin, uh, and I watched it uh, at the Dublin Film Festival just as corona was kind of creeping into our consciousness and then um, my hmm. husband was with me and he turned to me going there are scenes in that film that i don't think i've ever seen before mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which of course is not true they are still there <laughs> uh, but it was just that idea that suddenly uh, you know unfortunately it has this massive resonance and of course when i was writing it what I, what i was thinking about was this idea that how do i take responsibility for myself how do I take responsibility for my neighbor? How do I take responsibility for my community? What does that mean? Um, and that sense that, you know, none of us is an island. 
we are all a dynamic part of one big ecosystem. And at the time that I was writing, I was thinking about climate change and the fact that, you know, Mm. we think of ourselves as individuals who don't have an impact on our community at our peril. But the metaphor, of course, resonates even more strongly when our community is itself really directly under threat as it is now. Could I, just as a general question, what do you have coming up? Uh, you said that you were in the middle of uh, in filming. Obviously, things are on hold, but do you have anything uh, in particular uh, that's on the horizon besides yeah, well, Sea Fever, um, of course? We've, uh, we've stood down. We're uh, in the middle of filming a big nine-part Netflix mystery thriller. We filmed oh, wow. in New York and we're filming three months in uh, in Israel. So that stood down, obviously, for the duration. So hopefully we will finish that when this storm passes. And then mm. I have another grounded sci-fi film that I want to make after this. So uh, watch this space. All right. Well, um, I don't think I have any more to ask. I very much appreciate you coming on to talk to us, Nyasa. Uh, yes. It is always a, a pleasure to talk to somebody who knows their stuff and, and, you know, and has made a movie where they definitely knew what they wanted to do and they've made that movie and, uh, and uh, very much appreciate you coming on. Oh, listen, it's been such a pleasure talking to you guys. And thank you for watching the movie with such attention. It is such a joy to talk to people who, who really have drilled down into the into the story. I really, really appreciate it. Cool. Can we uh, can we call you next time when you release the, the next movie? I hope you will. <laughs> we can talk to you all day. I could talk to you all day. Well, yeah. And then we'll have a movie watch party. That sounds great. <laughs> Let's do that. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, thank Niasa Hard- Hardeman for showing uh, for uh, jo- joining us today. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, uh, go on Facebook and all the things that we go to the, when you're commenting and everything. I'm not going to go through the whole list, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's Chris Atkins and Barrett Share and Niasa Hardeman. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter. Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasends.com. I think so, too. Well, it helps that you have such a pleasant voice. Oh, how very charming of you. (laughs) This is going to go well. I can feel it. Hey! (laughs)